and welcome to today's Mind Your Career program. My name is Adam Sylvain, and I work with the Alumni Career Development Team here at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar entitled, When What You Do Is No Longer Who You Are, Strategies for Later Career Transitions. Today, we'll hear from alumna Michelle Panner-Silver. Michelle is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto with joint appointments in the Department of Sociology and the Interdisciplinary Center for Health and Society. She has written numerous articles about work and retirement. Her book, Retirement and Its Discontents, draws from in-depth interviews with a range of professionals that captures concerns about what retirement means to emphasize the significance of creating new retirement strategies. Her work has been featured in Forbes, Zoomer, Next Avenue, Global News, The Times Literary Supplement, University Affairs, The Globe and Mail, NBC2 News, and CBC Radio. To learn more about Michelle, you can visit her website at michellepannersilver.com. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to cede the floor to Michelle. Great, thanks so much, Adam. So today I wanna to start by asking a question. By asking the question, how do you imagine spending the last few chapters of your life? If you lived in ancient Greece, you would have had several options for asking questions about big decisions. One option was to consult an oracle, and this is roughly how it would work. You would bring your question, a slaughtered goat, and money, and the oracle would go into a trance. And eventually she would come out of the trance, giving you her predictions. Throughout human history, people have craved prophecy or messages about events to come. Mayan calendars, seers, Chinese oracle bones, and Norse mythology all illustrate how people have long wanted to find out what is gonna happen next. Now, I'm not gonna go into a trance today, I do not hold any special powers to predict your future. Instead today, I'm gonna to share some strategies for later career transitions, as Adam mentioned, based on interviews that I've done with people who have experienced the transition to retirement. So there's three segments to this webinar today. The first is the art of retirement, where I'm going to say a bit about the history and the ambiguity of retirement. Then I'm gonna share four strategies for later career transitions with examples from interviews I've done with physicians, CEOs, and elite athletes. And I'll wrap up by talking about social implications and strategies for employers. But first, I just wanna say again that I'm so happy to be here. Um, I completed my PhD in 2010 at the University of Chicago. And, and while I was at the University of Chicago, I was a resident head, so I was really involved in the campus. and. I'm really grateful to Adam for reaching out to me and asking me to connect back in today. Um, as he mentioned now, I'm at uh, the University of Toronto. Um, and in my talk today, I'm gonna share examples from the experiences of some of the people whose stories are really the heart of my book, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. Um, and you'll see that I'm also gonna recommend other books throughout my talk today. For over a decade, I've studied the phenomenon of retirement, asking questions about what the word means to people, what the transition is like. Um, I've studied it econometrically, looking at what factors predict a more successful transition, and qualitatively looking at the transition in other ways and the implications of retirement for society. And I wanna just take a, a minute here to explain that the name of my book draws from civilization and its discontents, where Freud articulated the contrast between an individual's quest for freedom and societal norms that restrict these primitive instincts. He argued that social norms, rules, or laws that state, for instance, that we should not commit adultery or inflict physical harm on others, that these concepts limit our possibilities for satisfaction and contentment. Yet, as a society, we agree to live within specific boundaries and to follow certain norms to help maintain order. In my book, I explain that a fundamental tension exists between the autonomy, flexibility, and lack of boundaries associated with retirement and our instincts to maintain structure, a sense of social connectedness, and personal fulfillment. 
retirement has been socially constructed in a way that can give rise to feelings of great discontentment as it stymies some possible paths in favor of others. So my book's about people whose personal identity is closely tied to their life's work and the challenges that retirement can create. And I wanna be really careful to say that this is not a sentiment that's meant to be generalized. There are many people, including possibly yourselves, who can't wait to retire. And many who feel trapped by financial obligations that force them to remain in the workforce. Some of what I'll talk about today will have relevance for those people, but much of what I'm gonna discuss is centered on retirement as it relates to people who see their life's work as an important component of their personal identity. And I'm talking about people who are really good at the so-called marshmallow test. And whether you follow that study or see it as debunked, the main idea is that People who are consistently good at delayed gratification, the kids who didn't eat the marshmallow, who held, who held off, um, people who are good at delayed gratification can find retirement and later career transitions challenging. People who pursue higher education, particularly alum of University of Chicago, could easily fall into this group. I think that most everyone can relate to the idea of having a break or not working for a certain period of time, but I'm not sure that the idea of not ever working again is for everyone. Now, before I jump into discussing the art of retirement, I have a quick question that Adam is gonna help me out with, um, which is to say, what association does the word retirement have for you? And hopefully you don't mind clicking one of those. And while you're doing that, I wonder if I can uh, keep going a bit just to say a little bit about the word retirement. Yep, so the poll is um, being distributed now and, and folks are weighing in. Um, so just a few more seconds to collect those responses and, and I can share those out um, with you. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so we'll just, we'll pause while we while we um, see this. What, well, what I'll do is I'll say a bit about the next slide, which is about the word retirement. And I'll just explain that initially retirement was used to refer to the retreat of armies. and Around the time of its first peak, near 1800, it was used to describe more general withdrawal or seclusion. So you'll see, um, oh, okay. So I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute. So, okay, so coming back to the poll, um, we can see that, ah, there's a great deal of variation. Okay, so it's really good to know that we're entering this conversation with a wide range of um, different point of views. And I find that it really varies with different audiences, um, but this is fantastic to know. So, um, okay, so we've got a, a big range and, um, and I'll come back to saying a little bit about the word retirement. And, um, and what I was commenting on, my apologies, I thought I could chat while you were clicking. Um, here we have a mapped out, you know, the history of the word retirement. And um, what I was starting to say was that um, you can see that there's sort of been peaks um, and that retirement has had a comeback. And now it mostly refers to workforce participation. Um, but it's been around for a while. It's a word we've had with us and it's time, its meaning has really changed over time. So I want to say a bit about the art of retirement. This is sort of the first mini segment um, of my talk. And, and what I want to say is that I think of retirement like art because the interpretation of retirement is really in the eyes of the beholder, as I think you all just illustrated <laughs> with the range of different perceptions you have or associations you have with the word. For some people, it's associated with freedom and leisure and happiness. Other people can't stand the word and associate it with boredom and death and unhappiness. And as we just saw, its meaning has really changed over time. And over time, we've come to this point where we are living 
in remarkable times. Most of us are living longer than we have in all of human history. And here we have life expectancy over time by continent, with life expectancy on the x-axis, uh, sorry, on the y-axis, and time on the x-axis. And what you can see is that life expectancy has increased dramatically all over the world since around the Industrial Revolution. And this is largely due to medical and technological advancements that have enabled us to decrease infant and maternal mortality and other mortality from acute conditions. So on this slide, we have about 200 years mapped out. But if we could extend this line prior to 1770 and go back even further, we would see that for most of human existence, life expectancy was under 40 years old. Now, now as you move towards the other end of the um, graph here, you see that there's some variation by continent, there's variation by country, but by and large across every continent, more of us are living longer. This means some of us are forced, longer, forced to work longer because we need the money, and others of us are being forced out to make room for the next generation despite our potential to contribute. So the takeaway is that as we're living longer, it's time that we think about the construct of retirement. And that brings us for just a minute to thinking about the history of retirement. And the key points that I want to make here are that number one, early pensions provided a modest amount of money that was a fraction of earnings for eligible workers who survived past the average life expectancy. And this is a contrast with current generations who are no longer satisfied with living on just a fraction of their income. And the second point that I wanna make is that early pensions were provided with the goal of making room for younger workers. In other words, retirement moved workers who were deemed to be too old to be useful from desirable positions in order to make room for younger workers who were assumed to be more capable, better able to handle physical labor and in need of salaries to support growing families. As you can see, there are many books and resources that can give you more insight on the history of retirement. By the early 1900s, most of Europe and Scandinavia developed public pension systems for workers who live long enough to meet the age of eligibility. In 1935, in the United States, Social Security was instituted for workers at age 65. And keep in mind that at that point, most workers were men. And the other important point is that life expectancy for the average worker was around 61 years old. So the short story, the key takeaway here is that initial retirement pension systems were intended to kick in when the average worker was already dead. Over time, and in periods of high unemployment, employers, unions, and governments have sought out ways to reduce the size of the workforce. And one solution has been to mandate or incentivize retirement at a specific age, with no consideration for an individual's skills, ability, and personal interest, workplace performance, experience, or institutional knowledge. Now, only a handful of jobs impose mandatory retirement in North America. For example, airline pilots and air traffic controllers have mandatory retirement. But throughout Europe, Asia, South America, public servants, as well as people employed across the private sector, continue to face mandatory retirement. And this is food for thought because around the world, we're noting that people are living longer. And this necessitates a shift in our thinking about the link between work and aging. Around the world, life expectancy on average at birth is about 72 years old, according to the World Health Organization. Although this average is calculated using sub-Saharan African countries where life expectancy is around 55, as well as countries like Japan, where life expectancy is around 85. Um, in the U.S., life expectancy is approximately 80. It's about 77 for men and 82 for women. Yet, 
most Americans say goodbye to the workplace between 55 and 65 years old. So the average retirement age in the US is about 60 and the median is 62 roughly. So a lot's being left on the table when it comes to people with great potential who are potentially interested in contributing to the workforce. Every day about 10,000 baby boomers cross the threshold of entering into traditional retirement age in the US alone. And they'll continue to do so for the next decade. The baby boomers have redefined social norms since they became a force to reckon with. In 1966, baby boomers were named Times Magazine's Man of the Year. And boomers have had remarkable experiences in the workforce. Whereas in the 1950s, women's workforce participation was around 35%. It went up to around 45% in 1970, and now it's just under 60%. Now, it's no wonder that they're redefining, questioning, and rethinking retirement. Many of the men and women have come to embrace a work culture which dictates that we're online all the time and able to work anywhere, anytime. This is particularly true for people who work for what Louis Kozer described as Greedy institutions. Greedy institutions require total commitment from their members, thus enabling the prioritization of institutional demands over participation in other non-work spheres. Greedy institutions demand undivided time, attention, and loyalty. This can mean working on weekends, at night, anytime, anywhere. I've written uh, papers about how medicine can be a greedy institution that demands total commitment from physicians, prioritizing institutional demands over these other spheres of life illustrated here. But there are many other greedy institutions that require us to work on weekends at night. Many of you will be familiar with that feeling that work can call you anytime. And after an adulthood that has been largely dedicated to work, the, the concept of retirement can be a complex endeavor, which requires some preparation. So I wanna share some strategies based on examples from people I've interviewed. And you'll note that some are potential models of what didn't work and others are models of what can be a good strategy. And the first strategy that I'll talk about is financial planning. And the key takeaway is that financial planning needs to start early and often. The next is to declutter. And I'm not just talking about your house, but all aspects of your life. Then I'll talk about practice and how it's not just something that we need to do as kids. Practicing is something that we must do in order to develop skills and habits at any point in life. And finally, I'll talk about staying active, not just physically. First, it's important to make the very basic point that financial planning is necessary. And you have many great webinars through the University of Chicago Mind Your Career webinar series, including a recent one about making sense of your 401k and lots of others. It's a really great resource. There are many great books on financial planning for retirement and there are dozens of great podcasts about retirement with new weekly updates, at the very least, some of them update even more often than that. Now, I want to introduce you to one of the participants that I interviewed, um, who's featured in my book, um, and this is Alan. Alan was an emergency room physician who told me very early on when we met that he often asked the question, if you're finished being a doctor, what is your value? His work often required quick decision making and it was all consuming. And at a certain point, it became more effective for Alan to simply stay in his persona as a doctor all the time, instead of switching to another role like father or husband once he came home from work. Alan married twice and he had five children, two in his first marriage and three in his second. 
Over the years, he bankrolled private school tuition, music lessons, ski trips, orthodontist visits, college tuition, weddings, and house down payments for his two oldest children. He wanted to be able to do these things for his younger children as well. Alan claimed that his financial obligations had prevented him from planning for retirement financially. And his drive to stay focused at work had kept him from planning for retirement mentally. He never created the time or mental space to create a financial safety net for himself. Then Alan was forced into retirement when his medical license was revoked due to claims that he was no longer competent. He had always given more than 100% to his work and admitted to being generally unavailable for his family, except as a provider. Then, unfortunately, he worked past his prime. Though it may seem ironic because their incomes are not low, physicians tend to struggle with financial management throughout their careers. With limited personal time, many physicians report being unable, too busy, unwilling, or even unaware of the need to plan for their retirement. These challenges are exacerbated by the likelihood that many physicians are self-employed and they tend not to have an employer-sponsored pension. So they must take the initiative to invest for retirement independently. This might sound familiar in other lines of work as well to some of you. Another important challenge is that for many physicians, work identity is synonymous with personal identity. And thus, many cannot imagine life without practicing medicine. Alan's immediate interests took priority over long-term planning. His story underscores the importance of financial planning because retirement is much better when it's a choice. The next strategy I want to discuss is decluttering, not just your home. This is about applying the skills you've developed throughout your life and at work to focus on what brings you joy. We've all heard the stories of hoarders who end up unable to get through the front door because there's so much stuff in the way. And some of us may have had the challenging experience of moving yourself or a parent or a loved one who accumulated a lot of extra baggage. Now, I'm not gonna give you a Marie Kondo lesson in how to fold, but I will echo her advice of simplifying, organizing, and asking what sparks joy. These ideas are important, not just to the rooms in your house, but are relevant to finances and personal relationships and other aspects of life as well. Philip is another person with a story worth sharing, albeit very briefly here. His adulthood had been focused on moving up the corporate career ladder. Philip was committed to work to the point that he had prioritized work and work relationships over his marriage and other aspects of his life. He described extramarital affairs and time spent away from home, all justified in the name of work stress and the pursuit of work success. When he retired at 65, it was a challenge to his ego because he had always derived a strong sense of self-worth from his work. But eventually, when Philip realized that he probably wasn't going to die within the year he retired, like his father had, he came to do a few things that I believe are worth sharing, mostly related to decluttering. Philip and others that I've interviewed have used an important strategy, which is to apply what you do or did well at work to create your retirement plan. So that means making time to declutter bills and papers and consolidate your financial portfolios. For Philip, this was not simple because he had lived and worked in three different countries during his adulthood. Philip also had some work relationships that he came to realize were not as fulfilling in his retirement. Some were with people who were still working when he retired Others were competitive relationships that he no longer had a need for. Philip applied the attention to detail that made him successful in his work to get rid of some of the clutter that had manifest in his life over the years. 
so that he could focus on what mattered most to him. At this point, I think it's relevant to share some of Laura Carstensen, an esteemed professor and gerontologist at Stanford University that's put together a meaningful and well-regarded theory called socio-emotional selectivity theory, which suggests that as people's time horizons shrink, as it does with age, people become increasingly selective about what they choose to focus on. They optimize their time and emotional energy by investing their resources in emotionally meaningful goals and activities. Thus, aging is associated with a preference for positive over negative information. And with age, people optimally, selectively narrow their social interactions to maximize positive emotional experiences and minimize emotional risks. So the strategy is not to rob yourself of taking time to invest in what you need to do to be independent. Whether it's cleaning up your house, or creating or organizing your investment portfolios, or continuing to work, or finding new types of work, or working in your neighborhood or with your community. Take stock of your personal relationships and financial goals and personal goals too, and eat the metaphorical marshmallow if that's what you really want to do. Don't let things pile up or put off relationships or interests that might spark joy for later. The next strategy I want to mention is to practice. And the idea is that when we go through big life transitions, we must practice. Practicing is not just for kids or early life stages. Malcolm Gladwell wrote about how 10,000 hours of, quote, deliberate practice are needed to become world-class in any field. Well, this is 20 hours of work a week for 10 years, or 40 hours in a week in five years. This is what most professionals accomplish relatively early in their careers. Elite athletes know better than anyone about the importance of practicing. They must possess incredible physical and mental energy, as well as the ability to focus on a singular goal and to practice in order to achieve their goals. In my book, I focus on the experience of elite athletes to illustrate how their focus on singular goals comes at the cost of developing a well-rounded self. And I describe how the all-consuming process of rising to great heights in sports can create very low points in retirement. So Allison started training when she was four years old. She left her family really early in her childhood, and she trained eight hours a day, six days a week for over a decade. Her career as an Olympic gymnast left her body racked with pain. And when she retired, she had to adapt not only to the loss of companionship and community, but also to retirement's autonomy and independence. For many people, retirement means losing your connection to a community you immersed yourself in nearly every day. Allison lost her sense of purpose when she retired. What helped her was practicing something new. It took everything in her, but Eventually, Allison recalibrated her sense of self by re-channeling her energy into a new line of work as a paramedic. It was not glamorous or high paying, but what was fulfilling about the work was that it connected her to a bigger picture and a new set of communities. And in order to establish herself in this new stage of life, she had to practice a new role. Unlike Allison, who I interviewed when she was in her early 20s, Omar was in his mid-70s when we first met. And Omar had an amazing career as a runner, as an academic, and as an administrator. He had experience retiring from many different positions and roles in life. 
And he described each as a phase of uncertainty. And he really emphasized the idea of practicing to be effective in each role that he took on as a strategy which can help make career transitions smoother. And as something that we must do in order to get good, in order to get comfortable, in order to adapt to a new role. He also emphasized the importance of staying active in multiple ways. So for some people like Omar, this means continuing to work or finding a new job or a new line of work. And for others, this means engaging in continuing education. This can mean taking art history classes, cooking classes, pottery, engineering, archeology. span These can be fulfilling activities and ways to find new communities. For others, it means planning a trip, developing new social relationships, and finding new ways of engaging, and then practicing the habit of staying active. And as you can see here, there are several great books that I can't recommend enough to you on this topic. And this brings me to my final strategy. But I'm not just talking about staying active in order to maintain body function, although that is incredibly important. What I also mean is staying active mentally and generally keeping engaged. So Robert was a pediatric cardiologist who essentially worked as a physician and an academic, both full-time. At 75, he stopped seeing patients, and at his retirement party, he heard story after story about his life, commending him for the hundreds of patients he had seen and the hundreds of papers that he had written. But he told me that his retirement party felt like a funeral. And he wasn't done yet. So he decided to focus on his retirement in his final chapters. And in his retirement, he stayed active and he focused on what he considered to be his most important life's work in academic medicine. There are many famous innovators and individuals whose most significant contributions to society have come later in life. Darwin published The Origin of Species at 50. And if you've ever thought about expensive wedding dresses, you've probably heard of Vera Wang. Now at the height of her career as she approaches her 70s. But Vera Wang started off as an Olympic hopeful and then she went on to work in magazine editing and she started her own wedding dress design company at 40. If you recognize these actors, you know them for the contributions that they made later in their lives. It's not difficult to list more examples of major contributions made by people who were in later stages of the life course. And this raises questions about the associations that we have with age and work, or between age and productivity, or even purpose in life. As baby boomers are approaching traditional retirement age, organizations are at risk of a massive brain drain and a loss of intellectual capacity and institutional memory. Now, as more of us are more likely to make it into later stages of adulthood, in the past 200 years, in many parts of the world, life expectancy has doubled. The National Institute of Aging estimates that people living in economically developed countries have added approximately three months to their life for every year that transpired during the last century. So that today, nearly 15% of the population in North America is over 65, and 20% of the population in countries such as Japan, Germany, and Italy are 65 and over. Consider that just two centuries ago, less than 2% of the population was over 65 years old. Having more people living longer means that we have to rethink our understandings of the relationship between work and age. Unfortunately, ageism still pervades much of the workforce. Employers need to recognize this risk 
and creatively rethink their strategies to create more sensitive and sophisticated ways to capture mature workers' knowledge and to retain mature workers to the extent that the interest in continuing to work is mutual. All too often, employers make the assumption about workers based on their age alone. And there are specific things that individuals and employers can do. One is to consider that some people are eager to retire. And in that case, there are a host of decisions to make and actions to take regarding finances and decluttering and practicing and finding ways to be active. And the other is to consider that these concepts also apply in different ways. Experienced mature workers have important skills that are often overlooked. Some people are not eager or ready to retire or don't want to see it as a binary decision. In that case, a number of options exist. This is just a few examples here. One is creating job boards as ways to share jobs that are intended for mature workers. Another is job sharing, where, for example, individuals interested in gradually retiring are supported in efforts to cooperate with people who are taking parental leaves or other types of reduced workloads. And implicit in these options here is flexibility, including working full-time, working part-time. Some people tell me they work more in their retirement or find their most fulfilling work at a stage when most people are considering them retired. Um, another point is that flexibility really includes an emphasis on workers' emotional and physical health, um, that it needs to keep that in mind. Another point is later career mentorship programs that are focused on mature workers. So these can be peer mentorship programs. And the basic idea here is that mentorship is not only relevant for younger workers but it can be helpful at all career stages. And another point implicit here is that mature workers can do much more than simply be mentors to the next generation. So the age associated with our traditional retirement pension systems are quite simply out of date for many people. We live in remarkable times also because numbers are taking on new meaning. Many of us still live with the expectation that hitting a specific chronological age is telling of all sorts of things like how productive you are or what your creative potential is. I believe that we are missing out on a subset of society who wants to keep contributing but is being governed by anachronistic norms and ageist assumptions. So I want to leave you now with just a question, which is, if you knew that you had 100 years to live, how would you design them? It would be great to have an oracle to advise us on our optimal path, particularly during uncertain times. But remember that in adulthood, your chronological age is not really telling of much beyond when your next birthday is going to occur. And be mindful that aging today is different from the past. Today, you can be your own oracle. And that's all I have for today. Great, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for sharing um, your research and on this uh, important topic. At, at this point, I would love to um, open up our Q&A. So, for all of those attending, if you haven't written your questions in yet, please type them into the questions box now, um, and I'm happy to uh, to get us started. Um, I'm curious, Michelle, um, the slide that you shared with these uh, creative solutions for addressing um, you know, kind of diverse approaches to this uh, career transition. Did have you in your research have you come across uh, have you 
come across these solutions in organizations or um, yeah, seen some kind of novel approaches to how organizations are, are um, you know, tackling this increasingly complex question? Yeah, well, yeah, there's, there are a number of fantastic organizations and employers that are embracing or recognizing the value of um, hiring, rehiring, retraining uh, mature workers. And I think that um, more and more we're going to start seeing even more examples of this. Um, so, so certainly I have, um, I've done some work within uh, departments of medicine where um, they've tried to, where some of these challenges are the most difficult, um, where they've tried to create greater flexibility. Um, you know, some of the complexities have to do with the way that pension systems are structured or, um, or being self-employed and, um, or, or being government workers. Some of the, the um, challenges are there, but I think more and more we're seeing employers embrace the ideas and, and welcoming the, this because they're seeing the benefits of having a diversified workforce in terms of their age. Great. Um, thanks. I, kind of a related question to, to that. It, you shared a, f um, a couple of slides as well that talked about the um, changes in, in life expectancy, you know, across the globe. And, um, you know, and, and that varies, you know, depending on, on, on where you're looking. And I'm uh, curious if you noticed any uh, changes, you know, you, you mentioned how things are, are really kind of out of date in our country. And I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you saw in other places of the world even um, different approaches to, I guess, try and um, yeah, bring that life expectancy and the retirement question into greater balance. Yeah, well, I was recently in Tokyo and I think, you know, as I mentioned, Japan has an incredibly high life expectancy. In fact, Japan has the highest life expectancy in the world. Um, and there, they still have mandatory retirement in, in many fields of work, but they also have, in, which I'm not advocating for, but they, um, <laughs> none of my work advocates for that, but, but, um, but I, but there's a couple of components of what they're doing there that I think is really interesting. Part of it is really helping people prepare for transitions. So there, it's a you know it's a harsh transition. Um, but the other is to sort of get people to um, embrace the expectation that they can make a change. I think a lot of people in North America sort of um, have had this idea based on their parents or or movies or just media images from the past that you know make them think there's one type of work um, and that they'll do that for the rest of their life and you know if you look at millennials and other generations we're seeing like that it's quite different and and that there's um people who are you know having lots of different careers throughout their life and, and many of the books that um that i highlighted on one slide uh you know about encore careers and encore adulthood um, by phyllis moen really emphasize this idea that you know there's there's lots of lots of ways to embrace um what uh, what has been referred to as the third chapter um in in japan you know what you'll notice is that there are lots of mature adults doing all sorts of different things and, and they've really been quite effective in um you know in, in helping people rechannel and hiring uh, individuals to do work that was different from what they did early earlier in the life course as ways of keeping them engaged um, so you know it wouldn't be unique to walk down the street and see um, a group of mature adults as uh, you know um, security on construction projects or you know um, helping with street crossing and um, you know engaged in quite physical physically um, active types of work um, th those are just examples that you could just see on the street. And um, so, yeah, so I think that that is definitely um, a, a place around the globe to be watching because they will embrace these challenges sooner at an, and at a more exacerbated level than uh, most anywhere else. Great, thanks. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in here. Um, 
One is asking, I think, a point of clarification regarding the, the decluttering um, part of the strategy. Um, we have an attendee who um, says that they know um, retirees who do many things and seem to thrive with kind of having juggling many things. Um, how do you kind of reconcile that with the with the advice of, of decluttering? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. So I would say, oh, thanks so much for, for pointing that out because what I would say is that the idea of doing many things that would fall into staying active and decluttering is not to say, don't do many things. Um, <laughs> decluttering is to say, really focus on the things that bring you joy. Don't do the crap that you don't really like, um, or, you know, make sure that you get the stuff that has to be done in order. Um, like your finances and I, you know, I've interviewed so many people who told me that they just never made the time to sort through um, their financial portfolios or, um, or widows I've interviewed who just didn't, who weren't aware of how things were organized. And, um, and so the decluttering is meant to say, um, take some time like literally use the part of your brain that you used at your work to keep your files organized or you know i mean it's like it depends on what kind of work you did but if you were you know like <laughs> i talked to people who were you know cleaners like professional cleaners and then but they they couldn't stand to do it at home and you know so the idea is that like apply the skills that you're good at to your own proximal life and the things that are important some of it is stuff you need to do, but hopefully much of it can be things that you want to do and um, and make time for those. The, the theory that I brought up under the decluttering um, is Laura Carstensen's socio-emotional selectivity theory. And um, that theory would absolutely say, like, keep engaged, but choose to engage in the things that bring you joy. So I'm kind of like combining that with the... <laughs> the um, Marie Kondo idea. Great, thanks for that clarification. I um, have another attendee who uh, is curious, you know, about um, some strategies and perhaps some of the strategies that you've talked about would apply in this case, but strategies for people who are currently working or looking for work, people in their late 40s through early 60s, do these strategies that you've discussed, would, would those apply or that, would there be other things that you'd suggest for, for those still in the workforce? I well, I there's a number of books about encore careers that I would, you know, that that I would look up um, and recommend, and you know, and that I I featured in one of the slides. Um, I would say that, um, yeah, that quite certainly these strategies could apply to it. I mean, first of all, you know, the overall message is to say, don't let anybody write you off based on your chronological age, um, and so you know that is highly relevant for anyone who is um, considering, you know, looking for uh, new lines of work or who has um, who has made that transition and is, you know, wanting to keep working. Um, you know, uh, I would say that, yeah, indeed, they all apply. So, you know, financial planning is important so that if it takes a while, <laughs> um, you know, you want to make sure that you have the opportunity to look for jobs that that will spark joy that you are interested in doing. Um, and I would say, um, you know, decluttering applies in the sense that, you know, you want to be able to focus in on and present your best self. Um, and, um, and of course, practicing is meant to say that, you know, if you are interested in a different line of work, practice, practice at it. Um, don't assume that it should just come to you immediately. You know, when children, even when children learn new language, um, it takes them years, if not decades, to actually get the grammar right. And, you know, and, and we sometimes write ourselves off as adults saying, you know, well, it's, it's hopeless, I'm not going to be as good at it. But but the point is that kids practice and they get lots of support and people practice with them. <laughs> um, teachers practice with them, parents practice with them. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. I know it, it might sound silly, but you know, the point is to be supportive and to say, 
you know, don't expect to be immediately good at things. You're going to be good based on having experience, but but it's still worthwhile to practice um, in order to enter a new line of work. And and then you know, staying active is is a kind of almost moot if the idea is to um, continue in the workplace because the idea is stay engaged. Um, but it's also meaning stay physically active because you know, the more often that you stretch or take lunch breaks where you actually walk around and move, the more likely you are to be able to function in any kind of job. So yeah, so they, they, all, they all do apply and I would say um, good luck and you know, best wishes or best wishes, good luck sounds like not as sincere. Like, you know, I, I genuinely think that, um, that, you know, we, that we are living in a, a fairly ageist society and that, um, that there is absolutely no reason that we should live with these out of date ideas that link age with uh, competence or, or um, experience. I think that it's, it's very individual. And a mistake when we write people off um, because they're, you know, more mature in the workforce. Great, thank you. I think we have time for just maybe a couple more questions. I kind of wanted to dovetail off of that last one and ask. It, it seems like a lot of the advice that you've shared um, really requires uh, a good amount of ongoing reflection. And um, I think you specifically mentioned, you know, at, at one point that you know the importance of for organizations, but I imagine also for individuals to sort of be planning for retirement um, transition early. And I was wondering if you encountered, perhaps in your interviews or in your, in your research, other parts of your research, um, any practical advice on approaching the topic of retirement um, as somebody working within an organization, like sort of when, you know, how to sort of tactfully um, approach that so that it can be something that is thoughtfully prepared for, for both the individual and the organization. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, the the point there is to say uh, approach it. You know, don't don't um, don't don't ass don't make assumptions about what employees want. Ask them. Um, you know, especially experienced workers, they know what their interests is, what their interests are and are likely to have a fairly good handle on what they're good at. Um, I've, I've interviewed many people who've told me, you know, the problem was that my boss never asked me, you know, I would have been so much better at X job and I could tell that everybody thought I was being useless, blah, blah, blah. Um, but if they just asked me, I would have, like, I know where I would have excelled. And, and I think that, um, the point is, you know, not to look at somebody's age and make assumptions, but instead to have ongoing conversations with workers at all stages of the career. So, you know, in other words, employers should not single out mature workers. Instead, that just like what, what happens all too often is that employers just go to people who are early in their career stages and talk about how they might transition into, um, you know, uh, jobs that include greater uh, uh, oversight and that sort of thing. And all too often they ignore having these kinds of conversations or avoid having these conversations with everybody. They just focus on certain uh, employees. And so, you know, so the point there is, to open up the conversations and not link them based on the employee's age and to ask the employee where their range of interests and skills are. Um, and, and I think that that makes a huge difference in terms of succession planning and also in terms of helping workers be their most productive selves. Um, and then, you know, with regard to ongoing reflection for the individual, I would say that um, that people today really ought to be mindful not to look at what their parents did. And here I mostly mean their father, because all too often I've interviewed people who said, well, you know, I just figured I'd retire when my dad did. And, uh, and then many people would say, 
well, um, my dad retired and then he died within the year. So I want to retire when he did so that I have at least, uh, you know, because I might die soon too. And the point is that we live in remarkable times in, you know, in a very short span of time, life expectancy has gone up really dramatically relative to prior points in human history. And but in fact, relative to almost all of human history. So it is highly unlikely that um, that your retirement is going to be anything like your father's. And um, and therefore to sort of like let yourself reflect on um, on, on my last point, like if you could design your life up to a hundred years, how would you do it? You know, life expectancy is um, is not there yet, right? It's still around 80 in the U.S., but um, but lifespan has actually been fairly stable, about 120 years, probably you know forever or since we've been around. Just that we haven't been making it that long, and um, and so I I don't think it's a Bad, I think it's a good exercise to sort of reflect on that idea of how you'd plan out your life, not just in the very early years. People tend to be good at that and not spend so much time planning out those later years. Great. Um, well, I think we're just about out of time, but I, there was a question from an attendee on whether there's a late career mentorship in Chicago, possibly through um, U of C. And I did want to share that in my post email, which I'll be sending to all the attendees. Um, I'll be sure to include a few resources. Certainly, I'll, I'll link to, um, to to Michelle's uh, book and her website, um, also to the the webinar that, that she mentioned about um, the, specifically addressing the financial planning for retirement, which, which some of you may be interested in. And then also, um, there is a, a um, student and alumni mentorship network that, that my team manages um, called WISER. Some of you attending may be familiar with it, but I uh, will include a link and, and some information about that platform as well uh, for those who may be interested. But um, yeah, I want to thank everyone for participating. A special thank you to Michelle for sharing her research on retirement and how we can make the most out of this uh, late career transition. Um, we are back this week on Thursday, May 30th for a webinar on how to write a compelling, convincing LinkedIn profile and networking prompts. This is the second of a two-part series on LinkedIn strategy that will be led by alumna Anne-Marie Segal. I hope uh, everyone can join us for that as well. Um, please visit our events page at careers.uchicagoalumni.org for the most up-to-date schedule of events. And once again, um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Michelle, and uh, take care, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.